Hey everybody, Mr. Gibson here with your next lesson in cryptography, and today we're going to be talking about the RSA cipher, which is the kind of probably most widely known public key encryption system used today. There's a few others that are moderately well known, like elliptic curve cryptography, but this is probably the most widely used at this point. So we're going to dig into the details and, and see how it works and look at an example. So let's just talk a little bit about the history of the RSA cipher. Uh, it was first published by Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Leonard Edelman in 1977. Um, and it was one of the first public key crypto systems, which is probably why it's still used today. First in the door, it really kind of sticks around for a while. So while some other ones have come up, this is certainly the most prevalent. Um, it's important to note that the algorithm that we use is relatively slow for computers to actually complete. So it's not used to encrypt large amounts of data. Um, in practice, it's actually most commonly used to encrypt keys to other more efficient ciphers that are more symmetric ciphers. So modern uh, symmetric ciphers that are used frequently are AES, Blowfish, and a triple DES. All of these are symmetric, so very similar to the more historical ciphers that we've covered in this course, um, but where they use the RSA cipher for the key transmission. So it's a nice way to solve that problem. Um, those AES, Blowfish, Triple DES are very secure symmetric ciphers. Um, the only issue with them is because they're symmetric is the key problem. So solve that problem with RSA, and those are great to use. A little bit of mathematics that we're going to need to understand to fully uh, work with the RSA cipher is this idea of the Euler's totient function. Um, so there's a lot of words there that are hard to pronounce. Uh, Euler is the, is the mathematician. Um, the totient is how you pronounce that word. And then the, the Greek symbol that represents the totient function is phi. So kind of a, a circle with a vertical slash through it. So we're going to represent that as phi of n, where n is any number, uh, an integer number. And what that function is going to calculate are the number of integers that are between 1 and n for which those integers are relatively prime to n. And just a reminder, relatively prime just means that the only shared divisor between the number and n would be 1. So for example, uh, phi of 8 would be 4 because there are four numbers between 1 and 8 that are relatively prime to 8. Those numbers are 1, 3, 5, and 7. Um, phi of 7 would equal 6. There are 6 numbers between 1 and 7 that are relatively prime to 7, and those numbers are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's going to be an important pattern there. We can see that when, when n is prime, something special happens. Uh, and then our last example, phi of 10 would be 4. There are 4 numbers between 1 and 10 that are relatively prime to 10, and they are 1, 3, 7, and 9. What we're going to see about the totient function is that there's not a formula that we can use to really calculate that. You actually have to go through and check each integer k, k being the numbers between 1 and n, and see if they are in fact relatively prime. We'll see that there's a few algorithms that have been popped up over the years that make this slightly more efficient, but not, not very. Uh, this gets really hard to do. But here's a few of those shortcuts I mentioned. If your number um, n is, is actually a prime number, so we can call it p, then phi of p is just p minus 1. We saw that in the example earlier. Phi of 7 was 6. Phi of 5 would be 4. That's because p, by prime, but because p is prime by definition, the only factor it shares with any other number is 1, which means that every number that's less than p is going to be relatively prime to it. So that's kind of just summarizing that observation. And then the second uh, important fact about the totient function we're going to need for uh, the RSA algorithm is that if your number uh, is composed of the product of two primes, so say p and q are two prime numbers, and n is just equal to p times q, then if you want to compute phi of n, which is the same thing as saying computing phi of p times q, it turns out this this totient function um, is multiplicative in nature, meaning that you can just find the phi of each of those primes and then multiply the, the result. So if we know that phi of p is p minus 1 and phi of q is q minus 1, then phi of p times q is just p minus 1 times q minus 1. Now that only holds true when p and q are primes. It doesn't work for all numbers, um, but it does work for these primes, and that is going to be helpful for us here in a moment. Okay, let's get into the RSA function. Uh, because it's public key, we need to have uh, a public key and a private key that are paired together. So we're going to want to generate those keys in a special way so they have the properties that we want. And we do that by starting out choosing two prime integers, and we'll call those P and Q. 
in this system, P and Q must remain secret. In fact, that is the secrecy this, this whole system is built upon uh, relies on keeping those values unknown to anybody but you. We're going to use P and Q to compute two other numbers. Uh, we're going to compute N, which is just the product of P and Q. That's going to be public information. That N is going to be just like with KID RSA, N is going to be the modulus that we're working in in our operations. So we're going to give that away, but just don't show how you calculated it. Then we need to compute phi of n, and since using the result we saw on the last slide, um, since we know that n is composed of the product of two primes, this is pretty easy for us to compute using that shortcut. We can just do p minus 1 times q minus 1. Phi of n needs to be secret. That is the real reason... Um, that is the real reason why this whole system stays secure, is that we're going to see that if anybody knew uh, phi of n, or knew p and q, and therefore could compute phi of n, this whole system goes away. It's not secure anymore. So we must keep those values secret. Then we need to choose a value for e. And e, just like in KID RSA, um, is going to be part of our public key. It's going to be a number that we use for encryption. So that's going to be public. And what's, what's interesting here is that we can just choose e. There's only one criteria, and that e needs to be relatively primed to that phi of n that we just calculated. So um, as soon as you choose E, you just want to do a quick check, is it relatively primed to the value of phi of n? A real common choice um, is to use this number 65,537. Um, two reasons. Uh, it's a large prime, so it's going to be relatively unlikely that it shares any factors with phi of n. Um, and then the second reason is a more computer reason. Um, it can be represented using um, 1, and then a bunch of zeros, and then a 1 in binary. And there's something about the way that this gets programmed using computer programming um, that makes that very efficient. That long string of zeros in the middle of the binary representation um, makes this uh, operation go a little bit quicker than it would otherwise. And then the last thing we need to calculate is D, which just like in KID RSA, D is a value that we're going to use in the decryption process. Um, D needs to be the multiplicative inverse of E in the modulus of phi of n. And we can quickly compute that using the Euclidean algorithm that we've seen previously. So again, you would not be able to get the value of D unless you knew E, which you will because it's public, and phi of n, which you better not because that is secret. Um, that's the reason why we need to that we need to keep phi of n secret is that if you knew that, you could quickly compute D, the, multi uh, the inverse of E. So you, you need to keep that secret. All right, let's see how this works uh, in practice here in just a moment. But first, um, let's see how we encrypt the message. So we encrypt a message. We take our message m, um, convert that to a number, and we raise it to the power of e and then mod by n. That's going to generate our ciphertext message as a number, and we'll call that number c. And then to decrypt a message, um, you take your ciphertext message c, you raise it to the power of d and mod by n, and that'll get you back to your plain text message m. So unlike with KID RSA, where you took your message and multiplied it by E, and then you took your ciphertext and multiplied it by D, we're raising it to a power here. And that's where the math, a lot of our mathematical security comes in, um, is that exponentiation is just a lot harder to wrap our heads around, both um, kind of mathematically, but then also computationally. It, it takes it to the next level, a little bit harder to calculate. So why does this work? Why is it secure? And how do we know that that encryption and decryption process actually works? Um, that's a long answer. The short version is it's complicated. Uh, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this course to explain why those operations undo each other. Um, so you should, if you're interested, want to see why that works, take a course on number theory or uh, read up on Fermat's little theorem. Uh, Fermat's little theorem is kind of the, the big mathematical result that's needed to prove that those two things actually will undo each other. Um, so I'll leave a link in the video description if you want to go read up on that. Okay, let's see an example done in practice here. So we've got our usual actors, Alice, Bob, and Eve. Let's say Alice wants to send the plain text message hi over to Bob without Eve intercepting it. So we've got the open lock representing plain text, which means that Bob needs to generate a key pairing so that Alice could get the public key. So Bob chooses these two prime numbers, uh, 1171 for P and 2099 for Q. Those are our secret. Remember, pink numbers and letters are going to mean secret information, and green will mean public. So the first thing Bob needs to do is compute the value for n. Doesn't want to show how he does that, so you wouldn't show the 1171 times 2099, but he gets the result of n equals uh, 2457929. 
Now he needs to get to work computing phi of that number. And because Bob knows P and Q, he can compute phi of n pretty quickly. Um, he can just do one less from P and one less from Q and multiply those together. Um, this is all now uh, secret information. Nobody should know that phi of n is um, 2454660 because he's now going to use that to compute his decryption key. He's arbitrarily chosen e to be 65,537. It could be any number that's relatively primed to phi of n, but this is a nice choice. He's confirmed that the greatest common divisor between e and phi of n equals 1, meaning that's the only shared divisor. So that's a good choice to use for E. Now he just needs to compute D. And I remember D is the multiplicative inverse of E in the modulus of phi of n. And we can use the extended Euclidean algorithm to do that pretty quickly. And he gets the number 1687553. So there's the three numbers that Bob needs to generate the public and private key pairs. And he does that. So there's the generation. Keys are generated. It is now time to share those keys. So Bob sends the public key over to Alice. Eve grabs it along the way. Um, not sure what she's going to do with that yet, but we'll find out. Now that Alice has the public key, she'll convert her message high into binary using the ASCII table and then convert that to a decimal. And now she's off to work to create her encrypted message. So she's going to take her plain text message, 267. 29 and raise that to the power of e and then mod by n. So this operation you're not going to be able to do on a handheld calculator. This this is a big calculation. You're going to need some serious computing to do it efficiently. Um, Python can do that with a built-in function called pow. Um, you can also give it to something like Wolfram Alpha and it will have no problem with it. But you're going to need some sort of specialized computer to do this. Your TI-84 or uh, calculator on your, on your phone probably can't handle something like this. So you're going to need something a little bit more specialized. But when she does that, she gets the number uh, 101-6955. That's our cipher text message. She could convert that to text using base64 if she wants to to make it easier to transmit. But it's fine. She can send it across the line that way. And she does. Uh, Eve picks it up on the way, so she knows the ciphertext and the public key. Bob now knows the ciphertext, but only Bob can decrypt it because only Bob has the private key. So Bob gets to work. He's going to decrypt that ciphertext message uh, by raising C to the D and modding by N. So in this case, that's uh, 101.6955 raised to the power of 168.7553, and then we mod by 2457929. Again, that is not an easy calculation to do. You're going to need something that's really good at computation to take care of that for you. Python, Wolfram Alpha, something. When he does that, he gets back the plain text message that Alice had created on her end, 26729. He can convert that to binary and then back to the plain text message, hi. Not that complicated of a process, but it does require some computing power. Now, Eve cannot retrieve that plain text message. She just does not have the ability to do so. Why? In short, again, multiplication is easy. It was easy for us to generate n and generate phi of n, which were the things that we needed to compute um, d. But it's really hard to do that if you don't know p and q. And if you don't know P and Q because you're Alice or Eve, you didn't choose them and you don't know them, um, you can't calculate phi of n. And if you can't calculate phi of n, you can't determine the decryption key D from E. Here's just a quick example. This is a relatively small value for n. You know, it's in the trillions maybe. Um, it's hard by looking at that to decide what P and Q are. Computer can do it, it won't take too long, but that's only a 60-bit modulus. And remember, in practice, these key values have bits that are thousands in length. These keys are thousands of bits. Uh, and it gets harder and harder for each additional bit for you to be able to factor that back down to P and Q. And again, once you have P and Q, you can, you can reverse engineer the decryption key, the private key. Um, so here's what they are, just for this example. But imagine if this thing had hundreds and hundreds of digits long, it's going to be very hard for any computer to do it, and that's where the security of RSA comes from. When we have moduluses that are hundreds of digits long, it takes computers hundreds of years of computing time um, to be able to factor those back. And, and at that point, hopefully whatever message you are using to encrypt has now gone out of date. It's important to realize that this is not a mathematically secure cipher.
With enough time and computing power, you can always break RSA. But what the premise is that it's going to take you too long for it to be worth your while for any message that you send using RSA. So that's the basics of the RSA cipher. Um, is our is our last cipher that we're going to cover in this course. Um, so I hope that you've enjoyed uh, learning more about it. And that's it for today. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.